there doesn't seem to be much to find out on the prairie near Shoto, Montana. But for paleontologists like Corey Coverdell, this is hallowed ground. So this area is famous for its spectacular preservation of baby dinosaurs, eggs, and those sorts of things. We are very well known in, among paleontologists and there are a lot of people who have come and studied here. In fact, the discovery that dinosaurs cared for their young was made in these hills. The very first baby dinosaurs found in a nest anywhere in the world were discovered here. And so researchers continue to search outcroppings in the hope of making a big discovery. They're looking for, for, for skeletons, for, for baby bones especially. But some scientists are seeking treasure of a different variety fossilized poop. These little magic packages can provide really special perspectives on ancient life. My name is Karen Chin and I study ancient ecosystems. And to do that, I often look at fossilized feces. Technically known as a coprolite. So skeletal fossils they don't always tell you too much about the behavior of animals. Whereas if you look at fossil feces, they are a byproduct of feeding activity of an animal. But in addition to diet, they can also tell you about what organisms might have been living along with the animal that defecated. And coprolites can also tell you about the conditions under which they were preserved. As such, they give us a totally different perspective on an ancient environment than we get from the bones. Sadly, these fecal fortunes are far more rare than skeletal bones. It's a little bit paradoxical that an animal only died once in its lifetime, but it defecated gazillions of times. But even so, coprolites from terrestrial animals are much rarer than their skeletal fossils. Their scarcity has a lot to do with how fossils are formed. Most fossils are preserved when they are buried rapidly. That is often a flood event or some landslide. But in addition to that, you have to have some mineralizing agent. Like phosphorus or calcium from the bones and tissues of a carnivorous dinosaur's prey. But if you take dung from herbivorous animals, in order to preserve those, you actually need an external source of a mineral Paradoxically, that comes from the bacteria that are feeding on fossil dung. Their metabolic activities can cause minerals to precipitate out. In either case, the resulting coprolites can be incredibly difficult to identify. Fossil feces can have many different colors. It can be pancake, they can be bulbous, they can be sausage shaped, and we have to look at several different techniques to try and determine if it is fossil feces or just a pretty rock. Once she's fairly certain she's got the real deal, Dr. Chin can begin to investigate its origins. You don't know who the perpetrator was, right? I will first see if I can see anything recognizable on the surface, such as dietary residues or burrows from organism that burrowed in after it was deposited. I may make a thin section of it. And I cut out a little piece and then I grind that down so you can see through it. Again, it's almost like you're in the field. You're like searching around the slide. Oh, what is that? Clues that say these are plant cells, these are animal cells. This is a piece of bone, it's a piece of shell. Dr. Chin and her colleagues can then start to get into the nitty gritty. I might do a chemical analysis of it to see what kind of mineralogy it had. You can look at organic geochemical analyses or isotopic analyses. This is a, a kind of a new field in studying coprolites. And with new techniques can come new insights. One of my colleagues, uh, James Super, analyzed some coprolites from the Arctic. Inside, he found compounds that give us clues about how warm it was 78 million years ago above the Arctic Circle. But of all the coprolites Dr. Chin has examined, none have provided more insights than those from Western Montana's Two Medicine Formation. I have spent many years studying these coprolites, and one thing that they revealed early on was the presence of very distinctive burrows that um, indicate the activity of dung beetles. As well as the occasional snail shell. More importantly, they were filled with tiny pieces of, of conifer wood. 
Dr. Chin mulled over those wood fibers until she realized that the dinosaur that ate them wasn't just munching on a pine tree. The wood had actually been rotted before the dinosaurs ingested it. We don't have modern mega herbivores like elephants making a practice of feeding on rotting wood, so that was a real surprise. But Dr. Chin had a hunch that maybe these duckbill dinosaurs had been snacking on something else entirely. Invertebrates frequent rotting wood, so if those dinosaurs needed a good source of protein, they go to a rotten log, and that's a great way to find proteinaceous invertebrates. Her hypothesis was backed up when colleagues at the Denver Museum of Natural History and Science made their own fecal find. They found coprolites in the Kaparowitz Formation, which is the same age as a tree medicine. They also have rotted wood inside. They also have evidence of dung beetles inside. But in addition, they have actually pieces of broken up crustaceans. They were clearly broken up, so they were ingested. Put together, these plain lumpy rocks reveal a whole ecosystem. We have hadrosaurs, we have conifers, we have white rot fungi, and we have dung beetles and snails, all in this one ecosystem, and we have fossil evidence of how these guys interacted. We can't get that from simple body fossils. Out on the prairie of western Montana, precious coprolites are waiting to be dug up. You probably won't see them displayed in a museum like fossil bones, but they're sure to provide us a spectacular glimpse into the ancient past. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then you'll love our other science documentaries. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, then join our growing community of supporters on Patreon.